Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hello, hello to all of you who are joining us today. Uh, today we have Aditi Desai. We are so proud to have you, Aditi, uh, to discuss smart cities. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just a couple of housekeeping uh, things. Please, everyone, use the chat to just say hi, tell us where you are uh, connecting from. As you're using the chat, make sure that you are not just talking to hosts and panelists, but you're talking to everyone. So in the little two, there is a drop down that says everyone. I'm just going to say hi to it right now to make sure that it's going to everyone. It says me to everyone when it goes to everyone. Um, Please put all of your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the, of the screen. Make sure you have your uh, captions on if you need them. It says show caption. You can click it in the drop down and it will start showing uh, the transcripts and the caption. And um, we have today our American Sign Language interpreters, Connor and Jeremy. Thank you so much for being here. Both of their cameras will be on, but they will be alternating between each of them. And uh, I think that's it for me today. Please use the chat to let us know where you're uh, logging in from. We always love to see you all. Um, oh, the chat is disabled. Thank you so much for letting me know. I, I was like, why is the chat not working? Because usually everyone is on it. Um, Colin, please, can you make sure the chat is working for everybody before I um, yeah. close my camera and let Aditi do her presentation? Aditi, thank you so much for being here today. We have been in deep conversation for years now by email. <laughs> We're very grateful for you, grateful for this opportunity to hear from you. Uh, Aditi Desai is also one of our fellows here at the Slow Factory. Uh, Slow Factory is proudly supporting this year 15 fellows uh, funding their research um, in human rights, disability justice, sustainability literacy. Uh, is the chat working now for everyone? Just making sure before I go. Yes, amazing. So I just sent a link to our fellows. Aditi is one of them. Uh, we are very proud this year to be funding 15 fellows, 15 researchers. Take a look at uh, their profile. And without um, further ado, thank you so much, Majda, for letting us know that the chat was disabled. Thank you uh, all for being here. And Aditi, thank you for your presentation. I'm going to go off camera and the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Celine. And thank you, everybody, for joining. It's so great to be here and to be a part of Slow Factories Open EDU. I have been following Slow Factories work for years now, and it's been a really transformational force in guiding my sustainability journey and really helping me understand why does sustainability matter? Who is it for? And how can we achieve collective liberation through the principles that Slow Factory, you know, focuses on, which is um, centering the voices of the global majority and having access to education like Open EDU, uh, which is really critical. Um, so, for those of you who aren't familiar with Slow Factory's work, and maybe you're, you're on this because you're my friend or family that I told you to watch, definitely please check out Slow Factory's work. Um, so yeah, as Celine mentioned, I'm a Slow Factory fellow. I am focusing my research on urban sustainability and smart cities. Um, just for a little bit of background about me, I work in climate tech. I'm a sustainability professional. Uh, I work for in EV charging startup, we're focused on decarbonizing mobility in cities. I'm also right now pursuing my master's degree at Columbia's Climate School in Sustainability Management. So really passionate about sustainability, but really grateful for you know the education that I've been getting from Slow Factory because it's really helped me sort of contextualize the work that I'm doing in climate tech and you know just in general in life. So. For today's session, I'll be focusing on how we can design smart, sustainable cities beyond economic growth. 
for those of you that have probably read the brief of this uh, of this session, I'll be focusing on topics such as degrowth. But you know, the main reason why I really wanted to focus on cities is cities are obviously big contributors to climate change. Uh, when you think about rapid urbanization and urban development leading to issues across transportation, housing, food, water, social issues as well. Cities are an interesting environment because they, you know, a lot of problems are generated out of cities, but they're also these really magnificent spaces for resistance, experimentation, and innovation. And this idea of a smart city, I'm here to poke a little bit of holes in it. Uh, I think that we need to rethink how we design smart cities beyond these, you know, beyond the imperative of growth, beyond the imperative of technology being the end all be all. And my goal throughout the session is to sort of convey and work with you all here to figure out how we can create urban sustainability in a way that, you know, has a regenerative, a regenerative benefit uh, for the human and capital human and natural capital that cities depend on. So going from this sort of industrial extractive paradigm that cities generally operate in right now and moving to one that's more ecological and regenerative. And, um, you know, with that, I'll kick off with a little bit of in a little intro of what cities are. And now this may seem kind of obvious, but I'm not sure if people here all live in a city. Please throw in the chat, you know, where you're based, if you've lived in a city before. Uh, I also just want to caveat by saying, you know, I'm based in the U.S. here. I lived here my whole life. Um, I've been living in New York City for about six years. And so any perspectives that I'm sharing on the urban environment are obviously influenced by my own personal experience and the research that I've done. But, you know, if there are any interesting parallels or totally opposite perspectives that you have on what I'm saying based on where you live, um, please share it. You know, this is a knowledge sharing exercise for me as well. Um, the research that I'm doing right now is, you know, this, this is really... I'm going through my own research journey on this topic as well and really look forward to learning from everybody else's perspectives. So when we think about cities, I like to think them as like I like to think of them as systems within systems. And I say that because you can think of a city as a massive ecosystem, but within them you have systems such as the ones identified here, energy, transportation, food, water. And within these systems, there are subsystems. So when you take food, for example, you know, it's, it's, it's agriculture, it's access to the grocery store. Uh, when you look at green spaces, green spaces are gardens, forests, um, etc. And managing all of these systems are separate from each other. But what's interested, what's interesting about cities is that although these systems seem apparently, seem apparently, um, you know, uh, isolated, they're truly interdependent. And cities are complex because they have these really interdependent material flows and processes. And when you think about what drives a city, you can look at it through, you know, economic, social, political, demographic, and technological drivers. And these drivers and systems, ultimately, you know, the outcome is human and ecological well-being. And how the word well-being is defined is uh, subjective. Some may say that well-being is defined by economic growth tied to GDP. Some may say that well-being is tied to having your most basic material needs met. And you could probably guess who thinks what about what, but, um, you know, I'm leaving that term well-being loose for now um, and, you know, hope to get into some discussions about that later on. So cities cover just 2% of the Earth's surface, but they're responsible for more than 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. And they use about 80% of energy production worldwide. I think that's just a really jarring statistic, right? You know, I, just 2% of the Earth's surface and, you know, 52% of the greenhouse gas emissions produced by cities are largely produced by just 25 cities, largely in the global North. Um, and this statistic is particularly interesting because, you know, the world's most populated urban areas aren't in the global north. They're actually mostly in Asia. Um, and 
So when you think about the impact of, of countries like Europe and countries in, in sorry, not con- Europe's not a country, countries like the US, countries in Europe, um, Australia, et cetera, you know, the magnitude, the sheer magnitude of of cities functioning as this growth engine, you know, huge material consumption and production. And um, yeah, that that's a that's kind of a jarring statistic to me. Um and you know, 68% of the world's population is projected to live in cities by 2050. Like I said, the world's most populated urban areas are largely in, in Asia. Um, but this number is set to increase. And that means that, you know, right now there's about 55% of the world's population living in cities. So between now and 2050, that's set to increase by about 2.5 billion. Um and you can imagine, you know, the amount of scale that's going to require in terms of land use, materials, et cetera. Um, and not only do we have mass urbanization happening, but we're also competing with the greatest crisis of our lives, which is the climate crisis. And, you know, as cities begin to grow, city leaders need to start thinking about how we can provide necessities for for those living in cities, right? You know, across those different systems that I shared, housing, food, clean water, et cetera, because rapid urbanization is leading to, you know, climate change and and biodiversity loss and cities often exacerbate those. Um, Some common issues faced uh, in our built environment include the urban heat island effect. So if you look at this diagram here, you'll see that, you know, throughout warmer, throughout the daytime, cities that Cities are largely comprised of, right, like asphalt, concrete, pavement, and those lock in heat. And so especially in downtown and commercial areas during the afternoon, you know, the heat gets trapped by by buildings. And, you know, when there's no trees, that means that there's less shade and, uh, you know, the air isn't isn't able to be cooled. People who are living in these environments are suffering from extreme heat waves. And, you know, in cities across the world, they're having to create these cooling centers, right? And so, you know, the the urban heat island effect is a result of, you know, tearing down forests, getting rid of gardens for the sake of building out massive skyscrapers. Um, And that's not just the only example, but you know, and then thinking about air pollution, as we know, fossil fuel emissions largely derived from transportation and buildings are some of the most potent, uh, you know, forms of or some of the most potent forms of um, chemicals leading to air pollution that's causing asthma uh, and uh, increased, you know, uh, CO2 production. Then you have habitat, habitat loss, right? So, you know, forests being cleared out what do you think happens to all of the animals and 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 you know plants and trees that that exist there and that habitat loss does have significant uh effects on you know our ecological our ecological systems and then there's of course public health outcomes right so you know co2 um and air particulate matter is very strongly correlated to things like asthma um diabetes, infertility, et cetera. But what's interesting and what may, and what many of us may know, many of us may not, but the effects of climate change and biodiversity loss are surely not felt equally across cities. Just because you're living in one city does not mean that you have the same access to green spaces. I mean, you have the same access to housing, et cetera. So to speak a little bit more to that, you know, and I'm particularly speaking in the context of the U.S., um, but how did we, how did cities get here? Why are there these unequitable health and social outcomes? So when we, in the U.S., if we date back to redlining and racial segregation around the 1930s, so that, so redlining is a federal mortgage appraisal practice that dates back to the Great Depression. So back in the 1930s, you know, as a way to remediate the effects of the, of the depression, uh, the government created the New Deal and the New Deal created projects to help stabilize the economy. Part of this process included segregating marginalized communities into urban housing projects um, so that white families could move into new suburban developments. And the way that these, um, the way that these, uh, you know, urban, I guess, sorry, the way that these redlining structures were set up is 
districts were literally categorized in, into A, B, C, D. And you can imagine that, you know, A, B, C, D was based on racial and economic um, characteristics of that person. And largely this impacted, you know, Black and poor communities. Um, and redlining is now technically outlawed, but I mean, you know, the implications are far reaching. They redlining continues to reinforce unjust living conditions. Um, and really understanding the history of this, the reason why I'm sharing this is because we need to contextualize how the history of housing policies il illustrate why cities still are discriminating, right? You know, um, and if you look at this map here, the communities that were marked in red, uh, which is considered the worst, um, they were indicated red to, uh, to show that they were risky for in for investment, meaning that, you know, privileged white families were favored for housing opportunities at the expense of minority homeowners who were denied loans. And so that that's where the sort of, you know, sprawl out to the cities came. And as I mentioned before, the legacy of redlining continues to persist. And they it takes form in many different ways. So, you know, the sort of capital deprivation that came from um, and wealth gaps that came from redlining in cities obviously led to, a you know, a, there's a significant wealth gap between redlined and non-redlined regions. So, Affluence is predominantly concentrated in white areas, whereas in black, poor, and brown areas, those they're traditionally overlooked. Um, there is a study that was done by Frontiers that says that you know neighborhoods marked as high risk for investment, th those red areas that I showed you that I showed in the previous slide, um, are now seventy four percent low to moderate income, and around sixty four percent. They categorize as minority, but meaning, you know, um, black and brown communities. And so, you know, this historical lack of resources, investment and development has resulted in poor infrastructure that increases the vulnerability to environmental hazards, such as the urban heat island effect, sorry, such as the urban heat island effect, such as um, such as uh, air pollution. Um, uh, there's another study that was done that looked at 108 different U.S. cities, and it looked at the land surface temperatures, um, and it showed that on redlined communities, previously redlined communities, those land temperatures are about 36 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Um, and that, I mean, that exactly points to all of the sort of issues that I was highlighting earlier. So, you know, having these exposures to um, you know, extreme heat and climate hazards are having a negative impact on human health. Um, there's just also this concept of sacrifice zones here, right, which is where communities are placed closer to hazardous waste sites. Um, and that's not just in cities. Sacrifice zones kind of exist outside of cities as well. For example, in the U.S., most of the United States nuclear waste is placed by the Navajo Nation, for example, right? Um, then, you know, you have minimal access to green space and tree canopy. Um, that is a very topical issue for those of you who have especially been following what's happening around Co Cop City, where, you know, DeKalb County and the areas surrounding Atlanta are historically redlined communities. And now the green space that they're so reliant on is being destroyed to create a public training facility, which is actually just, you know, an urban warfare training facility. But reducing, but cutting down on that green space and drink, tree canopy in a redlined area historically checks out. Um, I spoke, you know, to the, what the adverse health effects could look like. And then another point is around over police neighborhoods, right? You know, where there is underinvestment in housing, water, access to education, et cetera, that does ultimately result in an increased presence of policing, which is absolutely tied to, you know, the racism and brutality faced by Black and marginalized communities um, by the police is absolutely tied to some of the inequitable health outcomes that they face as well. So just shared some background because um, I really wanted to sort of contextualize why urban environments are important and why we sort of need to make this, um, why we need to make this transition uh, towards urban sustainability. And, you know, a very common uh, approach now to urban sustainability is, or, is around this concept of smart cities. Um, so 
look at this picture. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. I don't know about you, but back in the early 2000s, I feel like I would see this picture all the time and people would be like, in 2020, there's going to be these crazy futuristic buildings. There's going to be cars, hover cars in the air. And things look super strange to me. I don't know why the skyscrapers look like that, but it's kind of made out of a sci-fi fiction novel. And that's what, you know, you thought, that's what we thought. We, I, that's what I think, I, at least I thought smart cities would look like. But uh, in all seriousness, the term smart cities um, really grew out of, uh, you know, North American models of suburban development and um, ways to revitalize urban areas. This movement largely began in the 1990s um, and it centered on these ideas of smart growth and new urbanism. So smart cities were initially restricted to small, wealthy white cities. Um, but that sort of landscape has changed as technology has developed uh, to sort of make uh, the benefits of smart city, which are largely linked to economic growth and technology and bringing that to the mainstream. Um, smart cities is a term that's often used to tout development in the global south, right? So saying, okay, well, these cities need, need to like, you know, really ramp up their renewable energy sources. They need more housing. And while that is true, the question becomes, you know, is our smart cities, the, tr the traditional definition of smart cities, is that the right way to do it? So the definition of smart cities varies. Um, you know, they were developed to address urban, social, economic, and environmental challenges using technology and ICT, which is information and communication technologies, to pursue economic growth, give a better quality of life, and ultimately have, you know, also a better management of natural resources. So the definition of um, smart cities Usually the discourse has come from big, technolo big technology giants. So looking at this definition here, it says that smart cities use digital technology to connect, protect, and enhance the lives of citizens using IoT sensors, video cameras, social medias, and other inputs as a nervous system providing the city operator and citizens with constant feedback so they can make informed decisions. That's an interesting definition. Um, not sure if if that may necessarily be the most accurate way to describe what a smart city is. But um, another definition that was given by the World Bank is that smart cities are technology intensive cities. They have sensors everywhere, highly efficient, um, thanks to information that's gathered in real time by thousands of interconnected devices. Uh, a city that cultivates a better relationship between citizens and governments leveraged by available technology. Um, you know, this is, to, it relies on tech feedback from citizens to help improve service delivery and create mechanisms to gather this information. So um, those are what the definitions of, of smart cities are. Now to go into some of what the critiques are. So, you know, there's this concept that the, smart cities, the three, they're underscored by three sort of core tenants, economic growth, eco-modernism, and technocracy. So to go and teach one of them, economic growth. So I'm specifically talking about economic growth tied to GDP as an indicator of societal well-being and success, right? So, you know, if you think about it, our current economic system is leading us to overshoot our planetary boundaries. Um, and we can't simply continue to produce uh, uh, and consume at the scale that we are. Um, and, you know, our production and consumption right now is tied to economic growth. Um, and then the next concept is eco-modernism. So that's a newer sort of uh, economic paradigm that's evolved out of this, uh, you know, climate tech and clean tech movement that is, that pretty much says that we can decouple economic growth from resource use. So, that pretty much means that we can, you know, as technologies tend to get better, right, get more innovative, as we have more creative ways to create renewable energy, for example, we can also continue to uh, grow our GDP, because what we're doing is we're, let, we're using cleaner sources of energy, but we are also able to, um, you know, grow our GDP. So resource use increases, Sorry, resource use decreases, GDP growth increases. This 
Eco-modernism, also known as green growth, um, there's a lot of criticism about this uh, economic paradigm just because there really is no empirical evidence pointing to the fact that, you know, that resource use, uh, like, is able to uh, go, where resource use is able to be increased um, at, at a scale that is slower than what we have right now. Um, and also, unfortunately, green growth also doesn't account for the fact that, you know, a lot of resource use used by the global north is then outsourced to the global south, right? So when we think about how are we going to create, for example, let's talk about electrification, um, all of those materials, where is the lithium coming from, right? And it may not be coming from the US, but it definitely is coming from the global south. So green growth fails to take into account, you know, sort of what the uh, impacts are um, on sort of a holistic level. And then there is this concept of te technocracy. So technological determinism, meaning, meaning that technology is the end all be all and that it will solve all of the issues that we are having. Um, so given the context that, you know, I've shared about um, what the critiques are around smart cities, I'd like to think about how can we rethink smart cities in a way that goes beyond this traditional paradigm of economic growth? Um, where can we, how can we build regenerative cities that follow the, the similar ecological um, structures of our, of our natural systems, right? And so going back to um, the, the, the diagram that I presented earlier, I'd like to, you know, look at each one of these systems and sort of evaluate what are the principles that we can apply to a smart, sustainable city. And I want to make this a group exercise. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that I can sh I can take some notes here. But my activity is, you know, what do you define? What does a smart, sustainable city look like? to you. And I would love if you could just throw some something some words in the chat and I can put them in sticky notes here on my screen. Okay. Seeing some great ones. I'm just going to bear with me as I write some of these out. If you want, I can write, read them to you. You can write them. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Walkable. Mm -hmm. Cooperative. Not having to drive anywhere, I guess. Walkable. A city built for everyone, different body types and genders. Free transport, free public transportation. Mm -hmm. Lots of green, green. A smart city has no waste. Equity, sounds like a poem. Yeah. Access to green spaces, walkable, we said. Public transportation. Yeah. Energy from nature, wind, water, sun. Food access. Regenerative city. Community support. Nutritious Let's food. Let's keep it common. Community support. Nutritious food. Highly related. Interconnected. Mm -hmm. Public. Oh, yeah, I said that. Less police, less yeah. cars. Accessible. Third spaces. I, I love that one. I think that is so, so important and a bit of an underrated concept. Mm hmm smart energy infrastructure customized urban design amazing i got to open up a new note actually so <laughs> I'm share this with everybody um this is amazing yes new oops do this comment okay so let me get back to this community care. Okay. So we have. Oh my gosh, this is so incredible. I've never, I am so happy to see like 90 plus comments in the chat. Okay. Disability design. 
we have also um, customized urban design. Did you put that in? Customized? Yeah, I got, let me copy that actually. Over. Okay, cool. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Resident perspective. Oh, you're reading the oh, same thing as me. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, Cultural expression. Love that one. Oh, yes. Um, 15 minute city. Renewable oh, energy. Is, um, um, I'm not sure if you've all been following the discourse that's going on on the far right around 15 minute cities, but I guarantee what they're saying is not what 15 minute cities are. Um, but okay, cultural expression. Circular. If you can touch on that a little bit, that would be great. Oh my God, there's so many comments. Um, yes. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll definitely get to touch on that right after I jot these down. Bottom okay. up politics. Rainwater recycling, library economy, love that. Free food refrigerators, family friendly, affordable housing, artistic and creative hubs, true democracy, community led, composting centers. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Um, um. Oh, I love library economy. Yeah, you said that. That's great. Um, free food refrigerators, true democracy, community life, artistic and community hubs. I'm going to do another one. Wow, there's so many responses. I love it. This is your research right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Honestly, you, you all are giving me really, really great, um, you know, just concepts to continue looking into. Um, no surveillance, no surveillance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. after school programs, clothing swap, housing for all, third space, we got it, safe bike lanes. Free community centers, public swimming pools, tennis courts, healthcare accessibility, biodiverse. Yeah. Yes. Did I say wildlife? Uh, no, but that's a great one. Ethical flowers, zero waste, composting everywhere. Habitat for non-human communities, insect, birds, animals, variety, yeah. variety of jobs. Sharing economy. This is all so great. Zone for people, not cars and parking. Open source, no police. Mm -hmm. Free mm -hmm. culture and art for everyone. Public school system. Mm -hmm. Not depending on property taxes. Oh, that was a, that was a great one. Um, my God, there's so many housing for everyone, wealth intact. Yes, yes, yes. This is all so great. Libraries, multi generational maker spaces, urban farming. Yes, maker spaces. Natural building, accessible, no billboards and ads. Love that one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I think that no billboards and ads one is super, super, super interesting. Um, yes. Let's use the billboards for something else. <laughs> um, repair centers. The repair centers. That's amazing. Yes. Um, just yeah, clean air, water, soil. Public bathrooms is, yes. Yes. So important. Public bathroom, public showers. Yes. Vertical greenery adds our constant brain noise. Agreed. Okay. I think you have a lot. You guys yeah. are amazing. I love our community so much. You guys are so special. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I, I let you guys, I, I let you, sorry, Aditi, go on. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, I actually just want to take a, I can, I can take a moment to just pause here and let me just uh, can comment on the 15 minute um, city controversy that's happening. Uh, some of you may have, I first came across it on Twitter as one does. Um, but uh, so essentially, um, you know, you 15 minute cities are a concept that have existed for some time now. It's an idea where, you know, cities where people can take a short, can live uh, very close to where they walk, sorry, live very close to where they work, take a short walk to get there, um, you know, just having everything kind of designed in a manner that is accessible um, and small. Um, it's an urban design principle that's been embraced uh, by many cities, um, ranging from uh, certain parts parts within Paris to Cleveland. Um, however, uh, there's been some conservative discourse uh, around con around 15 minute cities um, being extremely uh, restrictive. So pretty much a lot of people are saying, oh, you won't be able to use your cars without the government's permission and consent. You'll be constantly monitored by surveillance cameras to ensure that you don't leave. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure where these conspiracy theories originated from, um, although that's not necessarily what 15-minute uh, cities, what 15-minute cities are. Um, but, you know, so first of all, thank you everyone so much for writing out all of these, um, helping me write out all of these different principles. I think you've really encapsulated exactly what, uh, you know, what a smart city could look like. And if I can take, you know, if I can look at some of what these, what the high level principles are of smart cities, I would definitely, you know, highlight that it's focused on, um, you know, in resources, infrastructure, and spaces that are shared and held in common. Um, technology is something that's convivial and serves social purposes and resource throughput is is minimized. And that sort of concept of of what a smart city looks like is where I believe that we need to go in order to have transformative uh, urban sustainability. So, you know, like I said, shifting from what the smart city framework is, which is extremely focused on, you know, economic growth and um, technocracy, but moving into one where, look, technology, we absolutely need it. I do think it's a critical part of, I do think it's a critical part of, um, you know, building out some of the infrastructure that we need. And the question isn't about the technology, but the question is who's using the technology and how is it used, right? And somebody asked a question about this. Exactly. Exactly, Tanya. You you hit the nail on the head. It, it's technology is a tool. And I, I do think that it can be a relatively neutral tool, but obviously the way it's been leveraged is a way that, you know, is not neutral. And somebody asked a question in the chat about, um, you know, a critique about smart cities and how they rely on surveillance technology. So that's absolutely um, exactly. And, and also how you access it. Right. Um, there definitely is a concern about you know, mass surveillance and corporate overreach by cities. And I do think that some of these issues around um, technology in cities uh, comes from the fact that there's been an increased reliance on the private sector. And I'm just speaking about in the U.S. I'm not really sure what it's like elsewhere, but in the private sector, uh, you know, the private sector is largely funding a lot of these technology product projects in cities. And so that's where you get this massive corporate overreach and surveillance and a lack of sort of transparency around how the technology and data is being used. Um, and, you know, it, it's, um, it's definitely uh, a, a challenge that needs to be considered, uh, especially as technologies are getting deployed. And that's still, that's happening, you know, across the U.S., for example, right? You know, the U United States has allocated massive public funding in the last year or two uh, related to infrastructure developments, if just to name the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, which is allocating a lot of money towards infrastructure uh, revitalization. And, you know, I am not going to overly compliment the Biden administration, but 
an interesting policy development that I think is going to help, you know, solve some of these technology issues in cities is um, there's a provision called the Justice 40 uh, initiative, which is focused on um, which is focused on which is focused on ensuring that at least 40 percent of funding and benefits are reaped by underserved communities. And I'm putting that term in quotation marks because that's an actual term that is uh it's a geospatial sort of term that's being used to categorize communities based on a variety of factors including um income status and um you know uh etc um so uh at least there is a sort of trajectory um for uh that those funds to be hopefully used in in a better manner um and uh i also think that you know the important question to sort of ask is, does technology and economic growth from a GDP perspective, does it actually fix some of the systemic issues that we that we were looking at earlier, right? You know, addressing issues of of income and inequality, addressing um, you know, racial and social justice issues. It, do those is technology actually solving those um, entirely, or can it be exacerbating um, some of those issues? Because if you take the example of the Rio Olympics, so you know back in 2014, um, and or back in 2014 when Rio was hosting the Olympics, and there are obviously a lot of issues with where, with when cities get selected to become Olympic cities. Um, 100%. But, you know, that was meant to revitalize Rio's uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, there was a, a really big goal to build out these massive information network systems to set, um, to, to help Rio facilitate, uh, you know, these large sort of sporting events, and then make them kind of the, um, the capital of future sporting events, but ultimately what happened is that that ended up resulting in, you know, massive displacement of people who were living around the area, living in Rio, um, and it didn't really solve issues of, of inequality. Um, so uh, there are a lot of different considerations, uh, I, I would say, when we think about how we can, um, you know, better use technology. Um, I actually think I'm going to answer some of the questions in the chat, if that's okay, Celine, because um, it's kind of tied into yes, yes, definitely. what I'm speaking about. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so one of the questions that I, I see is, um, you know, but governments would also misuse surveillance technology. How could tech for smart cities evolve without it? And Absolutely. I think that governments and corporations are capable of misusing technology in general. Um, and almost all technology could be considered surveillance technology, especially when you think about the integration of sensors and just data in general being, you know, um, accessed by governments and corporations. What becomes critical is who is act, who is a part of who gets access to that data as well, right? So if communities are playing a participatory role in how they, um, if communities are playing a, a participatory role in um, what technologies get deployed in their communities and who gets access to it, then I do definitely think that we're able to bridge some of those, um, you know, some of those concerns as well. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Are there ways that we can make technology work for us? Are there important laws that could be passed to protect us from harm and exploitation? Technology is important for education and advancement, but it feels like it's being used to mine data and profit off of citizens rather than um, rather than climate action. Yep, yep, definitely. I mean. That's certainly um, that's certainly uh, a concern. I, I think that again, it's really about who is designing the technology and how it's being deployed in in cities, right? I mean, you know, there are a lot of ambitious claims about the potential benefits of smart cities, whether it's increased livability, connectivity, sustainability, but it's unclear how these promises can be effectively, safely, and democratically delivered 
um, through these technological, uh, you know, advancements. Um, and I think that when we, it, it's really about, it becomes a design question because what does the term smart, like, what does that actually mean? Right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that if technology is designed on the principles of being clean, fair, green, sustainable, safe, healthy, affordable, resilient, then that design exercise will dictate what the outcome of the technology, of what the technology is. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Do you want to finish your presentation because it's 12.46 and then we go through questions? Because I feel like this exercise is so helpful for just understanding like what are the principles of a smart city and, mm -hmm. and go back to it at the end. But I feel like you have so many more slides. What do you want to do, Aditi? Yeah, I actually, so I, I was meaning to end on this slide here because I wanted okay. to sort of started set it up as a an exercise as an activity for the group and then have a discussion around that um but I, I do think that you know through this exercise we've really helped outline what a smart city looks like and um you know this I guess this course was really meant to sort of go over a framework with all of you here of what you think a sustainable city looks like because often you know the decisions that are made for our infrastructure health housing etc are determined by our government and corporations and you know they're whether or not you are a sustainability professional or you just live in a city, it's important to understand how you would like your city to be designed and sort of what are the ways in which you can actually, you know, take action and how these can sort of be, um, I guess, put into practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping, and I'm hoping, um, you know, that I can do maybe, you know, in a, as a follow-up session or something that I can maybe share with the group after later on, but um mm -hmm showing more implementation. I understand, you know, I didn't spend too much time focusing on what the implementation could look like. And truly it's because as I was doing this research, I kind of was mind blown by how many misconceptions there are around what makes a city smart. How do you assess what economic and ecological well-being looks like? And so I hope that I was able to sort of take you through, uh, take you all through, um, you know, what my what what a sort of framework could look like for um sustainable cities and you know another concept that i didn't get to fully touch on but is a huge part of it is um you know we talk about um degrowth uh in cities and i i was meaning to focus a bit on that during the session but got carried away by sort of all of the insights that you know you made me that you all made me think about but um so degrowth is in economic is, is a new sort of economic, political, social paradigm that has been proposed um, by ecological economists, post-growth economists that focus on, you know, how how can we equitably downscale our production and consumption so that we can increase human well-being and enhance ecological conditions at the local and global levels. So degrowth, a lot of people get very triggered by that phrase, like a lot of capitalists will be like degrowth, like a recession. Like, what does that mean? No growth. And degrowth doesn't mean no, no growth. Degrowth is not an economic um, recession, but degrowth is rather, you know, this a radical transformation in um, how do we scale down less necessary modes of production consumption? So for example, somebody brought up ads, right? Advertising, marketing, how is that as essential? Um, we obviously know that we need to move towards more renewable sources of energy, right? So, um, and, and no doubt about that. But do we, does that necessarily mean that we need to be producing tons of SUVs? Um, or should we be focusing on electrifying light duty vehicles, passenger vehicles, and obviously electrifying public transportation and getting rid of transit deserts? So degrowth is an exercise, which I think we did here by whether you realize it or not, but looking at these sort of concepts, right? So local small scale farming, um, public transportation, uh, um, what else? Uh, da -da 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 -da, uh, circular economy, of course, um, you know, affordability, et cetera, these are all principles of a degrowth economy. Um, and 
it's um, an interesting way to think about how we can shape sustainable cities because often, you know, cities are these growth machines. Like I said, you know, 80% of the world's energy consumption comes out of cities. And so in that situation, in that situation, you know, it, it really begs the question, okay, well, if, if cities are set to grow uh, up to, you know, what was the number? Yeah. If cities are set to grow up to um, 68% by by 20 by 2050 then how can we ensure that we are scaling how can we ensure that we are meeting these needs in a manner that doesn't continue to exceed our planetary boundaries in a manner that doesn't continue to perpetuate the sort of you know um uh consequences of environmental racism um and and that is the first step to rethinking how what urban sustainability frameworks look like. Um, so uh, I'll sort of kind of conclude my spiel with my spiel with that, but you know, um, I hope that this was was helpful and maybe I can just take some questions for uh, you know the last few um, slides. And I'll leave these up because they're kind of nice to look at. Um, so what Thank are your you so much? That sounds amazing. Let's do let's do that. If you want to go through, I'm trying to catch up on the on the Slack, uh, not on the Slack, sorry, on the chat, <laughs> because there are so many great comments that are being shared in the Slack uh, in the chat. Sorry, <laughs> in the chat at the moment. Um, but yeah. in the Q and A, you have about nine questions. Uh, if you want to take a look at them. Um, and, and, you know, go through them as we, as we keep up with the chat. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, let me just read through it. Da, 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 da. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. So first question, what about lithium lining and other precious metals from landfills? So, um, I mean, I briefly touched upon this, but as you know, as we move towards electrification, there's obviously this, you know, an accelerating the renewable energy transition requires a mass production of critical minerals. Right now, the United States in particular has a critical dependency on outsourcing, and particularly in um, South America. Uh, so for lithium, um, you know, most of the world's lithium comes from Chile. Um, and uh, mining for lithium, uh, for those of you who who may not know, but you know it has severe biodiversity impacts. You know, mining has become one of the single biggest drivers of deforestation, ecosystem collapse, biodiversity loss, um, and e e a lot of ecologists uh, estimate that even at present rates of global material use, we're overshooting sustainable levels by about. 82%. Um, it takes about 500,000 gallons of water to produce a single ton of lithium. Um, and uh, particularly in Chile, in the Atacama Desert, um, the uh, two species of flamingos have declined by 12 and 10% respectively between um, 2002 and 2013. Um, and in those in that same time period, the surface area of water fell by more than 40%. And so I'm sharing these statistics because, you know, we certainly do need to advance the renewable energy transition and cities need that, especially because right now what we're dependent on is extremely, um, it, it, we're, we're a fossil fuel dependent economy worldwide, not just in cities, right? But um, the way that I think to address this is truly from... Um, I mean, it's a supply chain. It's a supply chain issue, right? So uh, one, it's determining what do we actually electrify? Are we going to electrify? Are we going to go ahead and manufacture SUVs or should we prioritize, um, you know, light duty vehicles and public transportation? Um, how do, how does the, how can the U.S. cut down on its, um, you know, material dependencies um, as well, uh, as well, so that we can also advance electrification in the global south, right? Um, and then there's also, you know, there are a lot of technical uh, technological advancements and happening around the circularity of um, supply chains, and particularly for lithium ion batteries. So. I do think that those are part of the solution. So like I'm offering a technological solution, but then also recognize that there are these, like there needs to be, we need to understand that we can't electrify everything and still stay within our planetary boundaries. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. 
Next questions. Yeah, so much discarded things of value. Tell me about it. Circular economy, clean. Da, 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 da. I answered that one. Um, yes. Okay. How do we address the major issues in government that prevent the creation of smart cities? Example, um, lobbying against climate policies, not taxing billionaires, EPA working for rich people instead of in, for the rich instead of people, misinformation. Um, I mean, it's that's truly, truly the million dollar question, which is really, you know, I I genuinely think it is an act. One, I think it's it's around organizing communities and really understanding the ways in which, you know, um certain systems that we operate in are perpetuating the very issues that smart cities could bring up. So, you know, for example, like I said, I, I work in the electric vehicle charging um uh industry. My company, what we do is we turn lampposts into EV charging stations. Um, we retrofit the existing infrastructure to take up less space. Um, there's no construction or trenching done in the ground. It takes up no additional space on the sidewalk. And it also, you know, enables micro mobility charging. So, you know, being able to charge bikes and et cetera. And so I think it really, you know, your, to answer your question in a, in a very specific way, I think of, I sort of, think about my role as being one that um how do you do how, how can you sort of restructure uh electrification so that we're not um you know going ahead and creating these massive ev charging stations that take up city space right like reclaiming this, people should have access to cities and we do have cars um but what about ride sharing alternatives right so uber lyft other ride share ride sharing economies are absolutely a critical part of of the urban um of urban economic systems and um so you know how can we support those rather than supporting um rather than supporting you know private car ownership and how can we design technology that does that um i don't think i specifically answered your question in a grand way but uh, that's how i'm at least thinking about you know how can i avoid the issues uh that smart cities can potentially face um why do car activities totally dominate cities? Um, that's actually a really great question. Um, I it really goes back to the U.S. the Amer well at least in the U.S. I, I don't know elsewhere, but it goes back to the creation of the interstate highway and also redlining, where you know white communities were pushed were were creating you know living in suburban areas while black and poor communities were put in urban areas, and with that became this like utter independent utter dependence on you know you have to build highways, you need to create. Um, ways for people to get from their home to the grocery store. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, you know, just like exactly like concepts of white flight. Um, there's a lot of great research I can actually share maybe around why we live in a totally car driven country if you live in the US. Um, and, um, okay, cities owning rideshare platforms, not private companies. Um, that is a that there actually is an example in New York. I'm just looking it up right now. Um, right, New York ride share platform community owned. Um, let me find it. Uh, da -da -da -da. so, um, hmm, I can't find it. I'm not sure if this one is still active. I was thinking of another one, but there is one called, um, the driver's co op, which, um, is, you know, meant to be a ride sharing company powered by mobile app that is owned collectively by drivers. Um, and I do think there's another one, but if I find it, I'll definitely share that um, as well. Um, let's see. Da -da -da -da. I know I only have um, a minute left. Um, the question around, um, do you think it'd be beneficial for the government to provide a monetary credit to purchase an EV when, or would that cause more pollution and congestion issues? So the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. is actually meant to provide around a $7,500 credit to incentivize people to buy electric vehicles. $7,500 is really not a lot, to be honest, when you think about the market price of EVs right now. But it also begs the question, like you're saying, do that, does it actually cause more congestion? So it won't cause more pollution because there are life cycle analyses that show that, um, you know, while the material intensity of EVs at onset are pretty high, the lifetime of an EV produces less CO2 emissions and has uh, less impact than, you know, a gas vehicle. But it does pose congestion issues. For example, in New York City, there is the new congestion pricing, which has now caused a ton of cars to be 
in traffic on highways in the Bronx and Harlem, which is, you know, increasing the amount of air pollution in areas that already have a lot of air pollution. And so, you know, yes, there there should be a monetary credit. There is one. But that ne- that doesn't necessarily mean that there should be that should be used to incentivize personal car ownership. Um, and then uh, literature suggestion. So I actually do have a ton of books and podcasts to share. Somebody put in the Upstream podcast uh, that has uh, an episode about degrowth with Jason Hickel. Also, Upstream amazing podcast, like just absolutely brilliant. Maybe, um, maybe Celine, if um, you know, I can. Um, Yes, I'm going to jump in. You have a little more than a minute because we always spill over to 115 EST. So if you all are still tuned, like a lot of the folks are still here, if you want to keep answering questions, there's some really great ones also in the Q&A. I don't know if, I don't think you went through all of them. I didn't. Let me. Yes. Get back to like them. For example, are there ways we can make technology work for us? Are there important laws that could be passed to protect us from harm? and exploitation. Technology is important for education and advancement, but it feels like it's been used to mine data and profit off of citizens more than climate action and improving quality of life. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's a great one. Uh, I love the suggestions that you are all putting in the chat. The chat will be saved. We usually share it within within our Slack community. If you want to join our Slack community, I'll send uh, information if you haven't already it's also in the newsletter that we send um and you know for all of your references aditi i would love for you to compile everything and we'll send a newsletter to everyone that uh showed interest to your class or that came or, or registered and couldn't come and then we'll share all of that also on slack uh if if that's okay with you we can also be writing a slow journal entry with with um some of your notes, you know, if you want to append that, that would be amazing with all of your recommendations that, so that it's available for everyone. Yeah. Uh, but please be, go ahead. If you want to answer that question mm-hmm. about yeah. technology working for us, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Abs- oh, did I just lose that question? Oh, no, it was answered. Okay. Oh, it's under this one. Um, yeah, perfect. No, I clicked um, answer live. Sorry. Ah, okay, cool. No worries. No worries. <laughs> you go and answer, then you could see it. It's there just because um, I'm trying to clean it up. So we see which questions are left. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, how can we make technology work for us? Um, I mean, I, I think that uh, briefly you touched upon it, but it's really about, um, you know, who, who, who is making the technology, right? And what is the level of input that the community that, you know, everyday citizens have in its deployment? Um, often technologies are obviously designed with a very specific um, purpose and it's that's around data sharing, could be around surveillance, et cetera. I do think that an example of really interesting technology is just around citizen science, right? So, you know, um, citizen science really creates this like nexus between, um, you know, science and education when, and if it's coupled with emerging technologies, it can really allow people to share and contribute to data monitoring and collection programs and to also inform the, and to inform the areas that they live in, right? So, you know, there's a lot of citizen science, citizen science technologies around air quality monitoring. Um, and uh, it's, Community, and if you think about it, citizens are very well placed to monitor hyper local air quality, right? And so um, there's a few different technologies uh, that uh, are that do exist, um, and I will also share that as well. But um, you know, they're kind of like sensors that people put on their houses, and they're they're privy to all of the data, and they're able to take the data that they find about their air quality and then use it to you know, sort of push for better air quality standards. Uh, it's used for them to be more, um, you know, per- to, to play more of a civic and participatory role in um, in their, you know, in their environments. Um, I'll definitely share some of the companies that I found, but an interest, the reason why I think citizen science is also such a promising form of technology um, is also because, um, you know, there are times where the, there are times where, you know, if you look up, air quality uh, monitor, sorry, air quality uh, monitoring that's owned by the government, 
I'm I'm not saying this as a generalization, but there are times where it's not fully reflective and indicative of how bad the quality of air is. And, um, you know, it's really important for people to be privy for that to that technology um, so that they can use it in a way that isn't that doesn't further exacerbate, um, you know, environmental um, issues and et cetera. Thank you, Aditi. That's such a good point, the citizen journalism part of it and uh, collecting data on air quality because that information, as you said, is not uh, accessible. So the thing is this, is that there's a lot of uh, data being captured and collected, but very very little of it being shared or even shared in a way that uh, the public can understand it, which is uh, an issue. Um, thank you so much for pointing the, to, uh, you know, just sh shining the light on citizen science. I think that alone could be a class. <laughs> um, because we don't have that much time, first, I want to thank you because your presentation was incredible. The exercise you just conducted with what is an ideal uh, smart city is an amazing, amazing initiative. I think that alone is just like the tip of the iceberg of your research. And we would love to have you back Aditi on a part two for uh, smart cities because we just touched on a very very broad introduction in this class and we're so proud to have you as part of our fellowship this year of fellows this year very proud of of being able to support your research in in this way and very grateful for our community the answers you all came up with were so amazing thank you so much yes there will be a recording of this class in a few weeks. Uh, we have one editor on the team, uh, yes. so bear with us. We, of course, want to make sure that the video is accessible, that has, you know, the proper uh, caption and everything. Um, and so thank you so much. If you all want to support the Open EDU program, please consider donating. If you work within a brand, an organization, please uh, present this idea to them to support us. All donations are tax deductible. And, you know, we are able to present this body of work and make it accessible because of the generous donations we have received. Uh, we really care about making education accessible and free. And that's what OpenEDU is. Thank you all for your participation. The questions that are left unanswered, I think we can share them with you, Aditi, and you could maybe respond to them in writing. Yes, that, I'd love to. Yeah, I think that could be very good for us to... Um, Wow, there are so many Celines here. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> who they are, but um, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, so we will share with you the Q&A. We'll share with you the Slack. Uh, I mean, I keep saying Slack, but it's chat. I'm so sorry. Um, but of course, please join our Slack. <laughs> and um, Aditi, anything else that you would like to conclude with? Because it's good for you to choose something that you want to conclude with. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I just want to, again, reiterate, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you all for such a riveting conversation. And, you know, I, I know I was a bit high level in this conversation. Um, and I think it's just because city, it's such a map. Cities are big. And so is this topic. And there's so many different, um, you know, ways to look about it. And I hope that we set this up with a bit of a historical and contextual way of understanding, okay, what are act, okay, what do like what are the sort of things that we want to see in a city and like you said Celine would love to follow up and go into a bit more you know solutions based um solutions based uh ideas um of course but um you know again thank you all so much and i i really am grateful to be in a community um and i i do think that cities are so special and they really serve as a transformative force for you know this sort of collective um, you know, organizing innovation, et cetera. And, you know, I, yeah, I'm just really grateful for this opportunity and I look forward to continuing the conversation and, um, please connect with me, um, on Instagram or LinkedIn. And of course, um, I'm going to respond to these questions in writing as well. So thank you.
And I think what you could do, sorry, I'm on mute, I was saying, uh, is to uh, answer the questions in writing, maybe in a slow journal entry, so oh, sort yeah. of like a blog post, and add all of your recommendation, uh, your resources, uh, you know, um, the podcast that you mentioned and the readings and all of that stuff so that it could be accessible to everyone. And the class will be available in a couple of weeks. Thank you all so much. I want to send a special thanks to Connor and Jeremy uh, yeah, thank for you so much. our class today. Thank you very much for your patience. And thank you so much, Aditi. You were amazing. This oh, class is you. so inspiring. I want to build the cities of the future. Um, radical imagination and um, radical creativity and permission to really stretch the boundaries of what is a city and what a city looks like. And if you want to dive into the 15-minute city in, at length, I would encourage you because some of us don't know the critique that you've read and from uh, right-wing media or right-wing uh, thinkers. And so, if you want to put it in a, you know, and 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 juxtapose your response to it, because we 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 heard your point, but we don't know what the context is. So that would be also something maybe to add in your blog post recap uh, of your class. And I'll make a note of all of that. And thank you so much, everyone. Have an amazing weekend. Sorry for the daylight saving. Uh, I saw someone just jump in, Maria, Julia. I'm so sorry about daylight saving in the United States. Um, I, we should have made a note in, in caption and in newsletter that please be aware of daylight savings. But this class will be available in a few weeks and uh, we'll make a note for next time. Um, anything else? No, thank you so much. Thank you Thanks so much, Jeremy everyone. Connor. Thank you and have a beautiful weekend. Thank you again, Jeremy and Connor. Thank you, Aditi. Thank you. Bye. Bye.